Okay, so, welcome back. <laughs> this is the first time we have gathered for this function in this space since March the 12th of 2020. And I remember standing here that morning and saying, yeah. okay, do we want to do this or not? You know, because that's when things all started to do down. shut down. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you all said, yeah, you know, we all got to die of something. Um, <laughs> so, I don't remember that word. Even, I don't know. I don't remember that either exactly that way. But, no, but that's a fact. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, Father Time is undefeated. So, uh, uh, so we, we did do it that morning, we did not do the evening talk, and so we've been on a hiatus until, you know, we've, we've been doing this, this in church, but now we're, now we're back here and this is where we hope to stay, okay? So, uh, commercial, I have uh, plans to do uh, some one, one talk in June, one in July, and one in August, dates to be announced. Okay, and um, I, oh yeah, I think what I'm going to do is a series that I have done at the Shrine. It's called The Journey to Nicaea. And what that means is what, where did the church go from the, the time of Jesus to yeah. the formation of the Nicene Creed? How did we get from the Gospel to the Creed? It's, a, it's an interesting, I think it's an interesting journey um, and, and so we're, you know, I, I, want, I want to take a look at that over, over the summertime. And then in the fall, I think it's in, I think I have them scheduled here for, not sure, either September or October. And I would like to do the Acts of the Apostles, because I think that's another book that is misunderstood. We're finding out now that most of, you know, most of the Old Testament, at least the, the historical part of it, is misunderstood. That's what we're trying to clarify here. Same is true of the, of the Acts of the Apostles. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the plan for the coming months. But today, we are continuing our discussion of Old Testament history. And so we've been through the stories of origin. We've looked at the patriarchs. We've looked at Exodus and Moses and the covenant and the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites, uh, the unified, so-called unified, well, at the time of the judges, the so-called unified kingdom, then the divided kingdom, and we're going to continue our discussion of the divided kingdom this morning. Uh, and um, that will prepare us next week for a look at our, our primary, the guy who shaped Old Testament history, King Josiah. So I hope by now that Josiah's aims, Josiah's vision, kind of a vision of grandeur, uh, is coming into focus a little bit. Josiah pictured himself as the guy who would unite Judah. I actually have a map. The kingdom of the, the kingdom of the south, Jerusalem, okay, uh, and and the, the Israel, the kingdom of the north. So that centered in Samaria and over in here and all the way up in here. These these um, shadings don't make a lot of sense because the borders of these territories were so fluid, okay? But the south, basically this, the north, this, and along the, the coastline, okay? So it was Josiah's vision to unite south and north for the first time. And so in our, and that was number one. Uh, to, to build this gigantic empire that would go all the way from and we see it in the scriptures over and over again, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Nile River in the west. Okay? That is the territory that came to be known as the Promised Land. That territory is being uh, disputed today in the Gaza Strip between Palestinians and Israelis. 
So, you know, because there are Israelis who, who still believe that it's God's will that Israel include the Gaza Strip. Okay, so this is something that goes way, way, way back. That's number one. He saw himself as the, as the uniter and creator of this grand empire. Number two, he envisioned the religion of this grand empire to be, number one, the religion of Yahweh only, the God of Judah, and worship to, be, to take place only in Jerusalem. Okay? That's the vision. And so he shaped all of what we have seen about uh, Old Testament history in those terms. Yeah. Allison. What does it mean to only uh, worship in Jerusalem? That means uh, to, to uh, that means to worship only at the temple, as opposed to. So everybody would have to travel. Yep. Okay. As opposed to the wor what he did not like, the worship at the shrines in the north, okay. the shrines of Bethel, Gilgal, Dan, Carmel, those kind of places, all right? Yeah. They didn't have the synagogue then? Uh, no, okay. there, there are no synagogues. The synagogue does not uh, evolve until after the Babylonian exile, okay? Before then, the desire is to have everybody worship in the temple. You know, I have already said that, that Solomon there is no evidence that Solomon built the first temple, even though that's what the Old Testament says. So I did a little research yesterday. When was the first temple built? And the answer is no one knows for sure. Because there is absolutely no physical evidence of the first temple. The Babylonians did a real number on it, okay? And you know, it, it, wherever it is, it's way underneath all kinds of other layers of, of dirt and, you know, and, and rock and, and all that kind of thing. So they've never found it. But the speculation is that it was built in the 8th or 7th centuries, uh, which would be probably before the time of Josiah. Maybe, maybe by King Hezekiah, who was... Uh, another, you know, religious uh, Puritan. Uh, I, I don't want to call him a reformer because he he didn't. You can't reform something that never existed, right? You don't do that. Uh, the 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 Old Testament has it that he he was a reformer, but he you know you can't like I said you can't reform something that never has been there. So I have a suspicion. I can't obviously can't confirm it. I have a suspicion that it was built at or around the time of Hezekiah, who we will talk about today. So, Josiah has the Old Testament history, also known as the Deuteronomistic history, shaped in such a way that the people of the North and the South have always been one people. And so, they are the descendants of Abraham. So that one people migrated from Mesopotamia to Canaan, even though it never happened. But he paints the picture that way. So that, why? Because if they're one people way back when, then they're one people now. And they should be united. They should live in one kingdom. Does that make sense? So in a sense, Josiah is the new Abraham. And then these people migrate to Egypt, and they're enslaved. And they're led out of Egypt and into the wilderness by Moses. So again, they are one people. And so Josiah sees himself as the second or new Moses. Right? Uh, and then there is the conquest. The conquest of Canaan. So, and it's accomplished by Joshua. So Josiah wants himself to be painted as the new Joshua, just as Canaan was conquered once, so Josiah will do it again. Okay? Is, that, is this all kind of, is, the, is that make the picture a little bit clearer? I've been kind of painting the picture, you know, and only showing you, you know, one-eighth of it, rather than, you know, the, the, the big picture. And then there is the, the time of uh, the judges, 
when there there uh, when the pattern uh, uh, is is written or emerges where the, the people of God do something wrong they, and and, and the, the wrong thing that they do is worship idols okay they don't worship Yahweh then God punishes them they repent and say, oh God, please take this away from us. A judge comes in, makes things better, peace is restored, and then they fall back into idolatry once again. That pattern repeats itself over and over and over again. Josiah has the stories of the judges written that way for a very particular reason. As long as we remain faithful to Yahweh, everything will be fine. It's when we stray from the worship of Yahweh that things go bad. Okay? So there were no judges. But you can see why Josiah had the story written the way he did. And then there is the story of the unified kingdom. The great uh, time of Saul and particularly David and Solomon. The glory days between about the years 1,000 and 920. When David... Uh, unifies the south and the north didn't happen uh, when, is, when Judah the southern kingdom where Josiah was from is dominant even though it wasn't and where, uh, where, where Solomon builds a temple where everyone worships in Jerusalem at the temple so in a sense, and I don't mean this to demean the Old Testament history at all, the Deuteronomistic history, it is a work of religious propaganda. <laughs> there is an agenda at work here, okay? There is an agenda at work. Not a mean-spirited agenda, but an agenda. A political and religious agenda. Number one, politically he wants to unite north and south. Religiously, he wants everybody to worship only Yahweh, only in Jerusalem, only at the temple. That, if, if you can remember those things, you can go home now. Please don't. Yeah, you might have gone over this last week. Why were the North and South separated? They, oh, they, well, they were separated because they never were united. Okay, well, why, why were they always different? Then? Yeah, okay, so... What, we, what the archaeologists have, have shown us is that the first Israelites really were Canaanites. They were not a people that had migrated from Mesopotamia to Egypt, from Egypt into, into Canaan and conquered it. None of that happened. What happened was there, were, there, there, were, um, <clears throat> there was a group of people who had been nomadic shepherds who moved into the, uh, the hill country north of Jerusalem. So in here. Okay, the, and, and there was, and, and, they, and the archaeologists say that because they discovered a network of about 250 tiny little villages where people who had been nomads now began to settle. Why did they settle? They settled because they needed to raise their own food. Why did they need to raise their own food? Because they could no longer make the trip down to Egypt to get the food, which had always been there because uh, Egypt had the Nile River to rely on. You know, they, they didn't have to worry about whether there was rain or not, for the most part. So these people, you know, and, and, and why could they no longer go, uh, travel to Egypt? Because by this time, Egypt had been weakened by, remember these people, the sea peoples. These mysterious sea peoples had made uh, Egypt a weaker country. So it was no longer safe to go to Egypt and get their grain. So these people started settling in these little tiny villages. In, 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 uh, I'm over here. It's really over here. Uh, centered around Samaria, and as time went on, more of the you know the, the, these little villages grew, and these became this became the kingdom of Israel. And by around the uh, end of the 900s, beginning of the 800s, it became a legitimate kingdom. Okay. 
Fast forward, and I went through this last week, fast forward to the year 720. By then, um, Israel is, a, is a, a pretty relatively powerful kingdom. But powerful enough so that the Assyrians from up in here would come and conquer them, take them out of their land, at least some of them. Okay, So the, in 720, the kingdom of Israel comes to an end. Notice, it's not united to Judah. Okay? So what's going on in Judah at that time? Practically nothing. Okay. Okay. Judah, despite what you read about it in the, the, the book of Kings, about David and Solomon and all the splendor, Judah, as the archaeologists have told us, was a backwater, nothing uh, territory. Okay? So whatever David and Solomon were kings of, it wasn't much. <laughs> To the point where, you, you know, you have to ask the question, why wouldn't the Assyrians take Judah when they were, you know, conquering Israel? And the answer to that question is, it wasn't worth their effort. It wasn't worth it. Okay? It was so, it was so weak, it was so small, there just wasn't much there. Judah would then, as we'll see today, Judah would then become a, a more important, uh, strong kingdom because of the people who uh, immigrated from this hill country down into Judah to, to get away from the Assyrians. Okay? So that's when Judah became a strong kingdom. Mark, I, I'm just curious. When they took the, the uh, north, uh, 12 tribes or whatever were up in the north, did they just take them back, make them slaves, and leave, and leave the... Uh, the they didn't settle in there. They didn't use the land. Is that right? No, the Assyrians did not. Okay, that's what yeah, they just so took them why, out. That's why Judah then can, can grow a little bit. Take Judah over. can grow because of immigration from Israel, okay. from those uh, people who were left behind. A number of them escaped from the control of the Assyrians by going to Judah, and so Judah. We will see today. Judah grew in a period in, in, in a period of about twenty years. It went from a nothing kingdom to something that was uh, pretty powerful. So was it yeah. not tribal then? So you didn't have the tribes of the north and the tribes of the south? No. was it tribal. No. Then? It was written that way in order to say that this, these people descended from the sons of Judah, I mean, I mean uh, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Israel. Okay? So the, the tribes were, you know, invented, if you will, in order to say that these people, you know, the, the people who were at the time of Josiah had always been a unified people. They had always been one nation, but 12 tribes. They had a way of including everybody, so it was kind of inclusive, so you all belong to us. That's right. Okay. That's right. So, so he's justifying his... Uh, 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 desire to take over Israel. Does that make sense? Is, is this mainstream history backed up by archeolo archaeological studies? Because I'm yeah. sure the Israelis don't go along with this, right? I don't know. The, the, the gentleman whom I, the, the archaeologist historian whom I relied on the most is a guy who teaches in Israel. His name is, his name is Israel. Israel Finkelstein. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I presume he is uh, Jewish. Okay, so, you know, um, not everybody agrees with Finkelstein's theory, but I've read, you know, other theories. You know, another theory is that there was a slow migration of, of people from uh, Egypt into uh, Canaan. And maybe, but it, if there was, it was not significant enough to have, you know, created the population that eventually became Israel. You know, the, the, the story in the book of Exodus says there were 600,000 men, plus women and children, who, who fled from Egypt. No evidence of that at all. You know, just, just none. With all due respect to Charlton Heston, you know, there, there, there is no evidence of that. Charlie would not be happy. Yeah. <laughs> yes.
But this is my point, and this is why I titled this series the way I did. So these events and these people, for the most part, are not factual. Well, David is factual, Solomon is factual, these kings are factual. So, you know, a, a, a lot of what a, appears in the Deuteronomistic history is not factual. But it's all true. It's all true in the sense that the Deuteronomistic historian, historians, whomever they were, were writing about their faith. They're right, they were writing about the truth that they believed about God and about what God was doing in their lives. Like we do now. Okay? It's just that the story, you know, and as I said in week one, history was written very differently in the ancient world than it is now. Okay? Uh, history in the, in the ancient world was... Uh, a lot of times a work of, of uh, national or religious propaganda. The Egyptians did it. You know, when, 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 the, when the, the Greeks would write about Alexander the Great, they would say, you know, when, when he had the battle of whatever, you know, he killed 200,000 of the enemy in one day. Really? Mm -hmm. You know, so they would, you know, you take something like this and you, you know, you make it into something like, the like that. A big time embellishing, <laughs> right? Yeah, and you know the the guy who was writing about the the great uh, accomplishments of Alexander the Great wasn't there when it happened. But as I said in week one, he wants to make the boss happy, <laughs> you know. And so, yeah, how do you how do you keep the boss happy? You make the boss look good, right? <laughs> and, and and that's what they did, and that's the way a lot of ancient history was was written. Ancient history nowadays is more because of you know uh, uh, communication and technology. We can base it more on facts. Although, as we know right now, there are competing sets of facts about you know things that have happened in the recent past. So, is it is it that much different? <laughs> Maybe, maybe not. That's all I'll say about that, yeah. okay? Because I like my job. <laughs> so, all right, that takes us to, you know, where, where, where we are now. And that is uh, the reign of uh, Omri, King Omri, whom I'm sure you're familiar with. I wasn't either. Uh, Omri and his successors, his dynasty, okay? So Omri and his successors are kings in the north, in Israel, okay? The story of Omri and his uh, dynasty appear in the first and second book of Kings. And da -da -da -da. did I go the wrong way? Yes, I did. There we are. Um, so it, we, we read about him in the first book of Kings, chapter 16, verses 21 to 23. Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, son of Ginath, to make him king, and half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri overcame the people who followed Tibni, son of Ginath. So Tibni died, and Omri became king. In the 31st year of King Asa of Judah, Omri began to reign over Israel. He reigned for 12 years, Six of them in Tirzah. Tirzah, okay, but well, we'll see that they, they don't stay there. Okay, so during his reign, uh, Omri, you know, consolidated his power, and he built a new capital not too far from Tirzah, a new capital in Samaria. And that would be, you know, eventually it would come to be known as the territory of Samaria. Hence the Samaritans. Hence the good, the good Samaritan, right? Came from that area. So Omri reigns for 12 years. He makes Israel a stronger kingdom. This is, of course, the story as it appears in the Bible. All right? So keep that in mind. And then his son Ahab takes over. And Ahab reigns for 22 years. 
Um, this is what the uh, first book of Kings says about Ahab. And Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all that were before him. Not good. He took a wife, took for a wife, Jezebel. We, remember, we know that name, yes. And we know that song too, don't we? <laughs> and, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. See, that's a bad thing. Right? Yahweh only. If you don't worship Yahweh, you are bad. He erected an altar for Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah, A-S-H-E-R-A-H. -E and Asherah is a female counterpart to the Supreme God. So there was a belief, at least for a while, and this is verifiable, that even Yahweh had a, a, a female partner, and, uh, Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Not, not so good. Okay. So, some stories about during the reign of, uh, of Ahab. Jezebel once hosted a dinner for 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. She showed her favoritism. And then she ordered that all the prophets of Yahweh be killed. So, not good. So, then Ahab is challenged by the prophet Elijah. And this is a story you might be familiar with. So Elijah uh, challenges the prophets of Baal and Asherah uh, by saying this. He, he, Elijah, will build an altar. And these prophets of Baal and Asherah will build an altar. And they would sacrifice an animal on it. Okay? So they both build their altars. And then, you know, uh, they're waiting for God to accept the sacrifice of one of them sounds like Cain and Abel, doesn't it? And so uh, Yahweh does not respond to the uh, offering of the uh, prophets of Baal and Asherah, but he lights the fire of of, uh, of Elijah. Okay, meaning that he accepts his uh, sacrifice. So the people who have seen this, of course, there's a huge crowd there. They pay homage to Yahweh, good thing, and they kill all the prophets of Baal and Asherah. All right? Now, when that happens, Jezebel is angry, and she forces Elijah to flee to the desert. And there he receives, in the desert, uh, Elijah receives a message from Yahweh, and that message pronounces uh, doom upon the house of Omri. He, he tells uh, Elijah to eventually, not right away, to anoint a guy named Hazael as the king of Aram Damascus. Aram Damascus is up here. Okay, Damascus is still there, right? Mm -hmm. In Syria. Okay, and, and Hazael, we'll see, will, we will see, will eventually uh, attack Israel. Um, he, he then orders uh, Elijah to anoint Jehu, who is a member of Ahab's army, to be the next king. He orders Elijah to make Elisha the prophet in his place. Okay, so these three, Hazael, Jehu, and Elisha, would punish the house of Omri, the three of them together. Here's the quote. And him who escapes the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him who escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall slay. All right, no hope. Even after that, Yahweh gives Israel, gives Omri, I mean, gives Ahab two more chances to redeem itself, okay? So Aram Damascus, attacks Israel twice and is defeated by Israel. But Ahab uh, didn't go along with the script. He messed <clears throat> up. He spared the life of the king of Aram Damascus. It's not yet Hazael. It's his, his predecessor, the famous Ben-Hadad. Okay? Uh, he 
God had ordered him to kill Ben Hadad after they they won the battle. Ahab, you know, didn't do it. it. It sounds odd that God would order somebody to kill somebody, and it's a bad thing because he didn't do it. It sounds strange. Then, uh, so, so that's the political situation, but there's more. Not only were the um, Omri's uh, religiously bad, they also did not treat their own people well. Okay? So there is the example in the first book of Kings, chapter 21, where uh, Ahab wants the, to buy the vineyard of the guy who lives next door, a guy by the name of Naboth. Okay? So, um, he, he tries to negotiate with Naboth. Naboth says, this vineyard has been in my family for generations. I don't want to sell. So Naboth refuses, and so Jezebel, uh, you know, makes up a story. Uh, they, 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 he tells two of her buddies to invite Naboth to dinner and then to accuse him of something uh, when they're at dinner to accuse him of blasphemy. They do, and the people who are there at the, at the dinner, they hear that Naboth is blasphemed. <gasps> and so they stone him to death, which is exactly what Jezebel wanted. Okay? Now, Naboth being out of the way, Ahab can take over the vineyard. Okay? When this takes place, Elijah goes to Ahab and delivers this prophecy. In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. Ooh. <laughs> Behold, I will bring evil upon you and will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, because you have made Israel to sin. The dogs shall eat Jezebel within the mound of Jezreel. Anyone who belongs to Ahab who dies in the, in the city, the dogs shall eat. And anyone of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the air shall eat. I'm sure Ahab <coughs> didn't appreciate that. But that having been said, soon after this, uh, Ahab goes to battle with Aram Damascus yet again, and he's killed in battle. And as his body is being brought back to Samaria, the dogs lick the blood from the chariot as the chariot's being cleaned. Yeah, it's a little gory. It's, you know, this is a... Uh, to fulfill the prophecy. Yeah, yeah. So the prophecy, the, the prophecy is fulfilled. Okay? Now, Ahab's son, Ahaziah, becomes the next king. Um... He, and he's a terrible sinner. And why is he a sinner? Because he worships the idols. He worships, he does not worship Yahweh. <clears throat> and then the, the last of the Omri kings is Jehoram. Also you will see it Joram, J-O-R-A-M, or Jehoram, J-E-H-O-R-A-M. Could be either way. By this time, Elijah's a predicted king of Aram Damascus, Hazael, he, now he is the king. So he defeats Israel, and in the battle, Jehoram, the king, is wounded very badly. So then uh, Elisha, who is now the prophet, but it takes a scorecard to keep track of all this, right? The new prophet, Elisha, he has Jehu anointed the king, just as God had told Elijah. As Jehoram is returning from the battle, he's wounded, but they're taking him back to try to nurse him to help. As he returns from battle, he is confronted by Jehu. And Jehu shoots him in the heart with an arrow. Okay? And kills Jehoram. Yes. So then, Jehu, who is now the king, he has Jezebel thro thrown out of the win upper window of her palace. Okay? <laughs> she's pushed out the window. She dies. And what happens? You know what happens. Her body is eaten by the dogs. Okay? So all of the prophecies come true. All of these horrible things. Okay? Then Jehu has all the other members of the Omri family killed. End of the Omri's 
in, at the end of their dynasty. It's a brutal story. Wow. You know, the, we don't hear much about this in the Sunday readings, do we? We don't, we don't, we don't go through the whole Jezebel thing and the, you know, the, the shooting to, with the arrow and all that. All right, so is the uh, biblical story of the Omrids factual? Well, most of it is not. So the, it appears as though Omri and Ahab and Jehoram and Ahaziah and all these guys did actually exist. But there are some uh, big inconsistencies in the story, okay? Um, the, the, this, this invasion of Israel by Ben-Hadad, it, it's written about as though it happened during the reign of the Omri's. Omri's, it did not, okay? Uh, so, you know, that, that's, just, that's just one thing. Uh, it, but so many of, the, a lot of this story is, a lot of the, the story about the Omri dynasty is fabricated, but for very specific reasons, right? Oh, so what do we, what do we know about the Omri's? Factually, we do know that Omri conquered Moab. Moab is down here, other side of the, the Dead Sea. I presume, would that be modern day Jordan? I think that's modern day Jordan. Okay, so Israel at this time under the Omrids is an empire. It's powerful. It extended from Damascus to Moab. Okay, we know that Ahab uh, was a major player. He, he tried to form an alliance to go against Assyria. There's evidence of that. Um, and it was the Omrids and not Solomon who were the great builders in Israel. Okay? The, 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 the Bible would have you believe that it was Solomon who built all these palaces and stables and all of this kind of thing. It was the Omrids. And another thing to keep in mind, it doesn't seem to follow from the rest of it, but it's part of the story. It's relevant to the story. The kingdom of Israel had a very diverse population. Okay, so the archaeological evidence tells us that the Omrids were expanded Israel. That you know, under the Omrids, Israel was a powerful kingdom, even mini empire, if you will. And um, a, a, a lot of this, a lot. Well, in addition to the archaeological evidence, there is also evidence um, from the Moabites. Uh, there is a, 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 a stone called the Moabite stone that dates from the 9th century that tells the story, that includes the story of the Omrids. So it, 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 it's, it is a source for some of this information. Does that make sense? There is, a, there, there is an archaeological dis discovery of the Moabite stone. And the stone, it's not a rock. It has all kinds of inscriptions on it. Okay, but that depends on who's doing the chipping away on the stone, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, and, and you know, you have to take this corroboration with a grain of salt too. You you can't. It's uh, it's um, questionable to use just one source to try to validate this. Just like it's questionable to use just the Bible to validate you know history. You know, you, you need corroboration, and you need corroboration by archaeology, you need corroboration from other, the records of other, you know, countries. You know, there are, there, you know, there are, there are ways of, of trying to put together the best theory of what actually happened. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what modern biblical history is try, uh, historians and archaeologists are trying to do. Okay? They don't just pick up a piece of pottery and say, ah, oh, you know, this is from the ninth century. It must be from the Omrids. No, you know, you, you look for as much evidence as you can. Corroboration. Yes, corroboration, exactly. So when and why was the story of the Omrids written? Why was it written the way that it was? Well, it was written during the reign of guess who? Josiah. Josiah is writing or is commissioning writers in the six hundreds. Uh, Josiah reigned from about 640 to about 610. Okay, so it's after the time of the Omrids. And 
uh, it's written in such a way that Josiah seems to be jealous of the success of the Omri's. Okay? So, what does he say? He says, not, not so much about Omri, but Ahab. Ah Ahab was worse than all the other kings of Israel put together. Okay? He's terrible. Possibly because he's, he's jealous of the power of Israel at a time when Judah is not so powerful, okay? The little brother is jealous of big brother, okay? Uh, and here is where that diversity of the population comes into play. The diversity of the people of Israel left them open to the charge of paganism. If you have Israelites and uh, Moabites and Edomites and Canaanites and Philistines all living there, then they're not all going to be worshiping Yahweh. Right? And they're definitely not going to be worshiping in Jerusalem. So, um, Josiah's writers paint these picture, paint the picture of these diverse people as being pagans, which of course they were. Okay? And that for Josiah is a big no-no. That is the sin of all sins. Paganism. So that's why he paints them the way that he does. Does that, does that kind of make sense? But doesn't that also justify him treating them badly? Absolutely. Yes. But he has to conquer them first. He's got to whip them into shape. He's got to conquer them. Then make them, and I mean make them worship Yahweh. Um... Josiah is a, a, a very much a religious Puritan. Almost, I mean, I, he was radical in his desire to have both Israel and Judah worship Yahweh. Okay, um, yeah, he, you know, he had his. his I'm, I'm going to be careful about my language, but his his uh, desire to make them all worship Yahweh was really to force them whether they wanted to or not. Okay, that, that, was, that was his aim. Okay. Next. The fall of the northern kingdom. So now we've seen them at their zenith, at their high point. Now, what happened? Why did they fall? Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about that first, right? So we've already seen that Elijah's prophecies came true. Uh, the the last king is is Jehoram is killed, Jezebel is thrown out of the window, eaten by the dogs, and uh, you know there's a new king in town, <laughs> Jehu. Yeah, awful. So the Book of Kings says that Jehu and his successors destroyed the cult of Baal. Good thing, right? Where did he come from? Jehu, Jehu, Obaal. Oh, Baal is a Canaanite god. Oh. Okay. Whenever you see B A A L, Baal, that is the, uh, that is one of the chief gods of the Canaanites. Okay. okay. So he destroys the cult of Baal, but he did not destroy the shrines, and that's a no-no. Okay. Because remember, what does Josiah want? Everybody worshiping Yahweh. Everybody worshiping in Jerusalem. Not at the shrines. Okay, that's a that's a key distinction between the south and the north. The south is Yahweh only in Jerusalem. The north is Yahweh only and at the shrines. Okay, worship uh, the worship of Yahweh only in Jerusalem doesn't really become a reality until after the Babylonian exile, which is like in the 500s. So I'm jumping way ahead here when I say that. All right, so um, during the time of Jehu, here's that guy Hazael, who I mentioned a few minutes ago, who was predicted uh, by Elijah. He defeats the Israelites in battle. He, uh, Hazael is, again, from up here, Aram Damascus. He attacks, he defeats Israel, and so their kingdom becomes smaller. But the next king, a guy by the name of Joash, he restores the cities that had been lost, 
And then the next king, uh, a second uh, guy by the name of Jeroboam, the first king of Israel had been Jeroboam. This is Jeroboam II. He reigned in peace and prosperity for 41 years. Good run, right? Time of Jeroboam. It's during this time, this time of peace and prosperity, that the two primary prophets of Israel pre-exilic come to the fore, Amos and Hosea. Okay? And Amos and Hosea both condemn uh, Israel for two things. For its worship of false gods, no surprise there, and for its mistreatment of the poor, the widows, and the orphans. It is Amos and Hosea who will both say that to the Israelites, to the people of Israel, your, your worship, your sacrifices mean nothing if you do not practice social justice. Your worship of Yahweh is empty. God is not pleased with your sacrifices if you do not practice social justice. A message I think that still might ring true for us today. Yeah. How does that square with what uh, Josiah was saying of um, things are bad when you're worshiping idols, but things are good when you're worshiping Yahweh? Yeah. So 41 years of peace and prosperity, yet they're saying this is that you all are bad people. Yes, you, you've been reading so, my notes. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. So even though there is peace and prosperity, and from any other point of view, Jeroboam would look really good, Josiah will paint him as a bad guy. Why? Because it doesn't fit his narrative. It doesn't fit the narrative. Because he practices, he allows the people to practice idolatry. And this is the new the new insertion into the story, which which will, if you're here next week, we'll see where it goes, okay? And, and it's crucial. This uh, insistence on social justice, this becomes part of jo the, the narrative of Josiah. A part of the narrative that will have ramifications to this day, okay? So hold on to that thought. I'll just tease that. All right, <clears throat> after, the, after Jeroboam, things go bad. So Jeroboam's son, a guy by the name of Zechariah, he's assassinated after only six months in office. And then there is civil unrest. Whenever there's, uh, whenever there's a, not a king, a sitting king, it's, it's easy for you know, unrest to, you know, to take place and rebellion and all that kind of thing. Okay, it's at this point that the Assyrians who have already taken over Aram Damascus, the Assyrians who are the, now the great threat, the great regional, political, military threat, they sense that there's unrest in Israel. And this is their opportunity, okay? Um, so they, they come and you know, establish a presence there. But they don't actually conquer it, but they make Israel pay tribute, pay a lot of money for them to, uh, you know, keep the peace, okay? Um, then, in the year 722, a guy by the name of Shalmaneser, who is the uh, king of the Assyrians, or the emperor of the Assyrians, however you want to put it, he lays siege to Samaria, and he captures it in 720, okay? Some of the Israelites are deported, taken to, to, to Assyria, and uh, the kingdom of Israel is gone. The kingdom of Israel is gone forever. 720. Okay? So that's the way the, uh, the story is told. Or can I ask you just for, for a little clarification for me for not going to Catholic school the whole time? But I would, the thing was the, the traveler was coming down the road going to there. And he finds the Samaritan being beat up on the side of the road. Is that right? No. No? No. The, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Jewish guy who is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Oh, the Samaritan offers the... the uh, it's okay. the Samaritan yeah, the yeah. who, you know, first, uh, uh, 
two Jewish, like a priest and a, you know another official, they they walk right by the guy, and it's this hated Samaritan who comes and tends to him. I mean, the crowd when 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 Jesus you know said that parable must have thought, what? Are you kidding me? It would be a little bit like, you know, uh, well, you know. Uh, a, 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 you know, somebody's hurt in the street and a priest walks by and a, a, a minister walks by and they do nothing. And then, you know, uh, an Islamic terrorist comes and takes care of the guy. You hear that story today and, and we would say, oh, that's really wrong. You know, that, that's really wrong. So that's, you know, that, that, that's the equivalent. What I got from that story was Samaritan was everybody that didn't believe in Yahweh. Well, doesn't he? He is a believer in Yahweh, but he is still an enemy. Samaritans are are disliked. Oh, yeah. Okay. Pretty intensely. Yeah. So it's a real <laughs> turnaround. The Good Samaritan story is a real turnaround. All right. So, is the biblical story of the fall of Israel factual? Well, some things uh, are omitted, like. The Bible doesn't talk about all the different conquests of Hazael, uh, the, but but the story, in essence, in in some is is true. Okay, the Assyrians do start to assert themselves. Ahab uh, does resist them, uh, you know. But the Bible depicts Ahab as being evil, when in fact Ahab actually resisted. The, the takeover of the Assyrians, okay? So, from every other point of view, Ahab is good guy. From the biblical point of view, Ahab is bad guy, okay? Um, Jehu, uh, actually, and, and where, wait a minute, let me, let me look at my notes here. Um, back up. The page, um, yeah. All right. So, it, all right. And, and so, I'm already talking about Ahab. Ahab is painted as evil. He actually resisted the Assyrians. Jehu, who is painted as a good guy, a good king of Israel, actually paid homage to Shalmaneser, the Assyrian king. And how do we know that? Because there is um, an obelisk an Assyrian obelisk, the black obelisk, which shows Jehu paying homage to the pagan Shalmaneser. That black obelisk is in the British Museum, if you're ever, if you're ever there. Okay, so Jehu, painted as good guy, actually not so good, okay? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so then, you know, there, there's, you know, a, a return of prosperity dur during the time of Joash and Jeroboam, as I said, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's this point where Israel kind of reaches a, a certain peak. Uh, then, after the death of Jeroboam, there was turmoil, as I, as I said, and as the Bible says, and this turmoil is uh, 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 developing just as the Assyrians, under another guy named Tiglath Pileser, is you know becoming the, the major force in the in the uh, in the region. So then, the story of the takeover is true. The story of the, the conquest by Shalmaneser and all that, it's true. Okay. And I've already answered this question, but the question arises: Why didn't Assyria? when they took over Israel, why didn't they take over Judah at the same time? And the answer is clearly, it wasn't worth it. It was a little backwater country. It'd be, it's like, nah, forget it. We don't, we don't need it. Doesn't, it won't do us any good. Okay? So, obviously, the story is written during the time of Josiah. Why did Josiah paint the, the, the picture the way that he did? He contends, or he has the story framed in such a way that Israel's demise, Israel's downfall, is a result of their paganism. Okay? 
Because they're pagans, God is punishing them. And not only because of their paganism, but because of their lack of social justice. Please hold that thought. That's going to be critical for next week. That's the way to get them back, Mark. <laughs> so, uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned, yes. Next, next episode. So, there, there you have it. So, um, the fall of Israel is, is a fact. Josiah says that it happened because of their, their paganism and because they did not take care of the poor, the widows, and the orphans as Amos and Hosea had, had uh, told them to. Okay? That takes us now to oops, the rise of the kingdom of Judah. How did Judah go from little backwater nothing to a somewhat powerful kingdom. How did that happen? Well, let's talk about how the Bible depicts that. Okay? So, the Bible says that there were 11 kings who reigned in Judah between the late 10th and mid 8th centuries after Solomon. Most of these kings are depicted as being good. Why would they be depicted as good? Because they promoted the worship of Yahweh. Okay? In Jerusalem. And even when the bad ones disobeyed God, uh, as soon as they repented, things went well for them again. So the kings of Judah followed, the, well, the story of the kings of Judah followed the same pattern as the story of the judges, right? Things go bad, the, uh, uh, God punishes them, the, the king uh, pulls them out of the fire, or pulls them out of their troubles, uh, they repent, and everything mm -hmm. is okay once again. The story, the, the pattern continues. The worst king of Judah, now we're in the south, okay, we're centered around Jerusalem. The worst king of Judah was, according to the Bible, Ahaz, A-H-A-Z. This, uh, this is taken from uh, the second book of Kings, chapter 16. And he, Ahaz, did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Ooh. He even burned his son as an offering. Human sacrifice. Ooh. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, the shrines, and in the hills, and under every green tree. And the story says that because of this, the Edomites, people to their south, here's Jerusalem, people to the south of them, and because of this, um, the Edomites and the Syrians attacked Judah and laid siege to Jerusalem. Okay? So they get them from the south and the north. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, they're, they're going from two directions. And um, Ahaz, Ahaz, yeah, ah, Ahaz turns to the king of Assyria for help, and this saves Judah temporarily. Okay, so Judah, the long and short of it is that Judah is, is, most of Judah is conquered. Jerusalem is spared because Ahaz goes to the king of Assyria. Um, but then, uh, you know, so they're, all right, so, so, so for the time being, they're spared. They're all right. Now, Ahaz's son, Hezekiah, and Hezekiah is noteworthy for this reason. When The next time you hear Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, uh, and that's the verse that says, Behold, uh, a young woman or virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel. The next time you hear that prophecy, that prophecy was given to Ahaz. Uh, remember that that son whose name would be Emmanuel is Hezekiah. It's only 
much later on, and I can't do my walk forward in history because of the camera, but it's only 700 years later when the early Christians will look back on that, those words of Isaiah and say, oh, that also applies to Jesus. Okay, But in its immediate context, it is Hezekiah. So Hezekiah uh, is a religious, he is depicted in uh, the Bible, in 2 Kings, as a religious reformer. He forces strict adherence to Yahweh. He destroys the pagan shrines in the countryside. And he even destroyed Moses' bronze serpent. If you remember the story of the bronze serpent, the people in the wilderness complained as they did so often, God punishes them by sending them snakes that bite and kill some of the people in the desert. Until Moses raises up this brazen serpent, okay? And that, so things were so bad that Hezekiah even destroys the brazen serpent so that there's no trace of, of even the possibility of, uh, of paganism, okay? So, he purifies the worship of Yahweh, and as a result, things go well for Judah. Okay? So, uh, all right, so enough of that. It's this one. Yes. Is the biblical story of the rise of the kingdom of Judah factual? Well, yes and no. Okay, so... so uh, the kings who came after David and Solomon are probably real. And the dates of their reigns are probably pretty accurate. However, there was no, you know, we've talked about this before, talked about this last week, there was no golden age of the monarchy. There was no golden age under Solomon and David. That's, that's an embellishment. Nor was there the, the pure worship of Yahweh during the time of David and Solomon. Yahweh was worshipped, and so were other gods. Okay? The evidence, the archaeological evidence, indicates that the kingdom of Israel did not become significant until the time of Hezekiah. The kingdom of Israel, does, or, I'm sorry, the kingdom of Judah does not become important or significant until Hezekiah. What does that mean? That means that the people of Judah were in all likelihood idolaters, pagans, worship, you know, polytheists, worship multiple gods during the time of David, during the time of Solomon. Okay, so there was not this worship of Yahweh only in, in Judah, okay? During the time of David and the successors of David, there's no record of great buildings, there's no record of literary activity, no record of any kind of political administration in Judah. They're just not powerful enough. Okay? The population of Judah, until about 720, the population of Judah is about one-tenth that of Israel. It's just, to use a modern term, pretty much of a nothing burger, okay? Um, and so Judah grows, but very, very slowly over a period of a couple hundred years, from 920 to about <laughs> 720. It is growing, but it's growing very, very slowly. So you're saying there was peace for 200 years? Um, well, there was this attack by uh, Assyria, but it's, yeah, they, they, there was peace but primarily because nobody cared. <laughs> All right? You know, nobody cares. It w I guess it would be like, uh, you know, should, to use a modern day thing, should, should we attack, uh, should the United States attack Uruguay? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying, what, anything, I'm not saying anything against Uruguay, but it does, it's strategically, it, it, offers, it offers nothing. Right. Okay? Or, or here, here's a better example. Should uh, you know the Marshall Islands? You know, no. There's, there's, you know, 
the Marshall Islands, because of climate change, are probably going to be underwater within a few decades. Anyway, why did we go there? All right, so anyway. Well, we needed a, Why did we need, I go there, not you? Okay. No, we needed an island to get to Japan. That's yeah. why we did it. Yeah, the Marshall Islands, yeah. So, um, They're volcanic. Yes, so for those couple of hundred years, Jerusalem was not the only center of religion in Judah, okay? And how do they know that? So there is, the, the, the archaeologists have found clay figurines, they found incense altars, they found, you know, all kinds of vessels and whatever in people's households, in people's homes in Judah. They're worshiping other gods in their homes. There is evidence of this uh, Asherah, you know, uh, Yahweh's female uh, 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 cohort, okay, uh, in, in Judah during this time. So what this means is that Ahaz, who is depicted as a bad guy, was no better but no worse than any of the previous kings of Judah. They were all pagans, uh, all right? So, you know, this, this story about the worship of Yahweh only before Hezekiah is just false, okay? It's not backed up by the evidence. So, when and why did Judah become a powerful kingdom? So, Ahaz enters into an alliance with the Assyrians in 720, and this actually uh, helps protect Judah. It, 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 they, he figures, Ahaz figures, it's better to, if you can't beat them, join them, right? So what does that mean? That even though they lose a certain amount of their freedom, still they have peace, peace of a sort anyway. So it's during this time, from 720 till about the year 700, that Judah grows exponentially in terms of its population. Because it is at peace, it becomes a, a trader, a, you know, it, it begins to trade with, with other countries. It develops uh, its own ability to, to uh, have uh, administration. It keeps records, okay? So in other words, it becomes uh, it, its own entity. It becomes, in a sense, its own kingdom even though it is part of the economy of Assyria. Okay, does that make sense? So it's, it's growing in terms of an economic force or whatever, even though it's not completely free. At the same time, and I mentioned this earlier, a little while ago, it's taking in <clears throat> thousands of immigrants from Israel who are trying to get away from the Assyrians there. The Assyrians are leaving the people of Judah alone. They're harassing the people of Israel. They're leaving the people of Judah alone. So you go there. You go to Judah. So the population of Judah in a period of 20 years grows by 15 times. I mean, boom. You talk about, you know, sounds like Atlanta in the 60s and 70s, right? So by the 700s, by the early 700s, for the first time, the first time, Judah is a full-fledged kingdom. Okay? At the same time, during this time, when Judah is beginning to grow by leaps and bounds, two ideas, two religious, one, well, one political idea and one religious idea begins to take hold in Judah. The political idea is that Judah should be united with Israel. The second idea that begins to take hold is that the, 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 the this unified kingdom should worship only Yahweh and worship only Yahweh in Jerusalem. So the these ideas that encompass the vision of Josiah actually are beginning to take shape before Josiah comes to the throne. That makes sense. Okay, so they, you know, they, they, they become ambitious as countries, kingdoms, whatever, that get a little power tend to do, right? They become ambitious and oftentimes overly ambitious. Okay. What's that word there, Mark? M-O-N-T-A-T? 
Monotheism? Monotheism. Monotheism. The worship of one God. Okay, so the Yahweh alone thing. The okay. Yahweh alone, yeah. Okay? Yeah, the Yahweh alone movement. Okay, so long and short of it is the Yahweh alone movement began with Hezekiah. He did not reform something that had been there previously. Remember, prior to Hezekiah, the people of Judah are always pagans, if you will. They're always polytheists. They worship several gods. So Hezekiah begins the Yahweh only movement and then Josiah will build on it. So when and why was the story of, of the rise of Judah written? Well, of course it was written by the time of uh, Josiah. And by the time Josiah was there, Judah had become a strong kingdom. And here we see the vision that I've, I've talked about already a couple of times. Okay, Religion focused on the worship of Yahweh only, centered in Jerusalem, and also a combined history of Judah and Israel. If he can convince the people of Judah that those people in Israel are their brothers, right? That they've always been a united nation, then he will inspire them to want to conquer them and reunite two countries that have never been united. So you see why, so he's creating a history and that's the other, or, or and other idea that I'd like to keep in, in mind. The first one is social justice, the second one is history. He, he wants to create a history. And, and he did, okay? And what he created is the Deuteronomistic history. That, that's been the topic of this, this whole series. So this Deuteronomistic history is written in Jerusalem, and so naturally it makes Judah and Jerusalem seem more important than Israel and Samaria. So he, he back at the time of the patriarchs, where are, the, where are they buried? Where are the patriarchs buried? They're buried in the south. They're buried in Judah, not Israel. Uh, who is uh, Israel's favorite son? It's Judah. Judah is the one who is destined to rule over the other tribes. You see how he's shaping the story? Um, at the time of the conquest, only the Judahites were able to eliminate all the, the, the pagan Canaanites from their territory, not the Israelites. The greatest king, the great, the great king, David, where does he come from? He comes from Bethlehem in Judah, okay? Uh, Jerusalem is, uh, is written about as the focus of religious life in the United Kingdom, right? Not Great Britain, but the United Kingdom of Judah and Israel. Does that make sense? So you see how he's framing the story. He's framing history to, to suit his ambitions. All right, and finally, today, we will look at the reign of kings Hezekiah, we already looked at it a little bit, and his successor, Manasseh. All right, so what does the, te the Bible tell us about Man Hezekiah and Manasseh? All right. Hezekiah, who now reigns over a somewhat powerful Judah, as I said a minute ago, becomes ambitious. So he goes to the king of Egypt and says, let's form an alliance and defeat Assyria. Let's knock them out of the game. He, he wants to, the story has it that he wants to unite Judah and Israel which is really Josiah's aim, by getting Assyria out of the picture. So in the year 701, the Assyrians attack Judah. They, they sense what's coming and they attack Judah. And the book of Kings says that Hezekiah, you know, fought bravely, defended Judah and Jerusalem uh, uh, very bravely. The book of Chronicles uh, tells us and, and a lot of this is, is true archaeologically, that Hezekiah prepared for this attack very carefully. 
Um, he stored up grain, oil, wine, flocks, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, he, he also uh, had, he dug <coughs> through solid rock to be able to channel water. And maybe those of you who have been to Jerusalem, you may have seen this. The, uh, it's called uh, Hezekiah's, Hezekiah's, uh, what? His, it, not an aqueduct, but it has a quiet, Hezekiah's uh, stream or whatever. It goes from outside the walled city into the pool of Solon, and you can you can walk through it today. Okay, so he's very he's very much prepared. He's ready. Um, the Assyrians have no trouble defeating Judah, and then they lay siege to Jerusalem. And uh, the, uh, during this siege, as the siege begins. Hezekiah hears from the prophet Isaiah, who says, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. God's going to take care of us. And that night, 185,000 Assyrians were slain by the angel of the Lord. 185,000. Well, okay. So the Assyrians retreat. And uh, the and they're so humiliated that the king Sennacherib, he's killed by his own sons. I mean, he's you know he's lost face, I guess, and he's you know his own sons kill him. So then, Hezekiah saves Jerusalem. Hezekiah is then succeeded by his son Manasseh. Manasseh is described as a terrible king. <laughs> The worst king of Judah ever. If you look at 2 Kings, I don't think I have time to do this. No, I don't, I don't have the right page. Uh, and why is he, you can guess, why is he described as the worst king ever? He built or rebuilt the pagan shrines. Okay? The ultimate no no. Um, it, it, but it's more than just that. He practiced uh, soothsaying. He, all, he sacrificed his own son to the gods. And he consorted with wizards and mediums and whatever. Okay, so uh, he did much evil in the sight of the Lord. So the story has it. And Manasseh reigns for 55 years. Yeah, he had a, he had a long run. Okay, so that's the way it's that's the way it's told. Is the story factual? Well, some of it is, and some of it isn't. So the archaeology shows that Hezekiah's preparations for war uh, are accurate. Okay, he did build a twenty-foot thick wall to protect the western <coughs> hill of the city. He uh, he did cut a tunnel, you know, in, 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 into bedrock uh, to form, you know, from this from the spring of Gihon that went to the pool of Siloam. Uh, all right, but still, as the Bible says, the Assyrians were easily able to uh, defeat Judah. Okay. Uh, to the point where Sennacherib, far from being killed by his own sons, he had a, a, a wall relief, kind of a sculpture, you know, a, a relief created in his own palace back in Assyria that celebrated his triumph over Judah. Okay? Once again, that relief is in the British Museum, if you want to see it. If you want to see Sennacherib rejoicing, you know, or celebrating his victory over Judah, you can see that. The British Museum where? Uh, London. Oh, London? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the British took a lot of things out of the Middle East. <laughs> oh, yeah. Egypt, and yeah, they, they took a lot of, uh, yeah. World War II. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I should I should wrap this up, and I will. I will wrap this up now very quickly. Sorry about the time. So Manasseh takes over. He tries to uh, revive the uh, the Judean economy, but in order to revive the Judean economy, he needs to do something 
that gets him in trouble in terms of the Bible. He needs the support of the farmers. So in order to get the support of the farmers to revive the economy, he says, go ahead, you can rebuild your shrines, your pagan shrines, so that you can get the rain that you need and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So, so here's the, the long and short of it, because I'm, I'm, and I'm going to keep it short. In reality, Hezekiah, who is depicted as a good king, really wasn't, because it's his over-ambitiousness that leads to Judah being conquered by the Assyrians. Manasseh, on the other hand, helped restore Ju Judah's fortunes by playing ball with the Assyrians. And so there was peace and even prosperity in Judah for 55 years because of Manasseh. But he is depicted as a bad guy because he doesn't fit Josiah's narrative of the worship of Yahweh alone. And that, as they say, is that. And so next time we will, you know, we'll conclude with the story of Josiah and then what happened to Judah and Israel uh, in the exile, after the exile, and the importance of the Deuteronomistic history. Thank you very much. One question. Yeah, Jim. You said uh, in 720 the kingdom of Israel is defeated once and for all. Once and for all. Go on. Until 1948. Well, it's not a kingdom anymore. Now it's a nation. Uh, okay. Yeah. And it's yeah. It's a man.